Gaza is a hard place to live at the best of times. When it's under Israeli bombardment, it becomes a living nightmare. Covering the besieged Palestinian territory during war is a monumental challenge for journalists on the ground. My former colleague Shirin Tadros knows it all too well, having reported from Gaza at the height of some of the worst wars in recent memory. Every single person we've asked to describe what is going on just behind us is saying the same word. They're calling it a massacre. Her memoir, Taking Sides, chronicles her experiences there and across the Middle East during the Arab Spring. Shireen explains the toll it can take on a person's mind and heart, and why she traded in her career in journalism to become a human rights advocate. This is The Inner View. Former war correspondent, award-winning journalist, human rights advocate, and now with Amnesty International, Shireen Tadros joins us now. Shireen, good to see you. It's, it's been a long time. It's probably been more than a decade since we spoke to each other over the airwaves. How are you doing? I'm doing okay, Iman. It's so great to see you. Um, like you said, so much time has passed um, and a, a journey that I've taken um, since we last spoken as well and you've chronicled that journey in your book. Tell me a little bit more about the book. I, I'm sorry I haven't read the book. Um, when I had the idea to invite you onto the program because of the Gaza war, which we'll get into, we looked into what you were up to, and to our surprise, and it was great news to us, you, you wrote a book, which I will read soon. So tell us more about your book and, and, and what, it, what it meant to you to write it. Sure. Thanks for admitting you haven't read it first. That's refreshing um, from uh, from journalists and news anchors. Um, no, you know, um, I'm so interested in, in your own thoughts as someone who was at Al Jazeera English from the early days as well, because the book, it's called Taking Sides, a memoir about love, war and changing the world. Um, and I wrote it after I left journalism, after I just started um, with my human rights advocacy with Amnesty International, and I just joined the United Nations and representing Af Amnesty. And I think it's sort of told um, from that perspective, from a perspective of someone who was out of the game, who could be completely honest about what journalism does um, right and what it does wrong. And it's very much a, a gritty um, human, do not hold back um, account of my life and journey through war corresponding and into into human rights advocacy. And it really has a message trying to inspire people that if you see something wrong in the world, if you know that there are things that you, you believe should change, the inequality, injustice, it is your duty to do something about it in whatever capacity you have. And that if enough of us have that inside of us, we will change the world. So, you know, that's really the crux of, of taking sides and, right. and why I wrote it. So we're gonna straddle past and, and present. We'll talk about the book, we'll talk about your, your career. I think it's really important for us to talk about Gaza. And, you know, one of the ignition points in your, in your career was your coverage of the 2008, 2009 Gaza war. Let me ask you, as events unfold now in Israel and the occupied and besieged Palestinian territories, as war rages in Gaza, as the bombs fall, how do you feel witnessing this from the outside in? I'm, I feel destroyed. I feel like nothing has changed in the decade and a half. Um, I feel like I could be writing the same pieces, the same articles, broadcasting the same way as I did back in 2008 and 9. 
my heart breaks for 200 innocent people who were taken by Hamas from their homes and their and their communities. And my heart breaks for the Palestinians that are being killed, the innocent lives being lost as we speak right now in the Gaza Strip that is still besieged, that is still suffering under bombardment, as well as a lack of supplies, be it medical supplies, water, electricity, basic human rights that are not afforded to the Palestinians. And my heart breaks for the rhetoric, the rhetoric that hasn't changed, and that so many of us tried so hard to humanize Palestinians in this past two decades, to really try and show you, you know what, you may not know where the Gaza Strip is, but there are mothers and brothers and kids that want to grow up to be doctors and people who look just like you in the Gaza Strip. Mm. This is not a a territory, a 40-kilometer stretch of land full of terrorists, you know, launching rockets at Israel. This is a community of people that deserve their basic human rights. And I feel defeated and destroyed because that is completely lost. And and when I watch the news coverage, when I speak to people, the the lack of humanity, it's, Mm. it's heartbreaking. And um, when you were doing your reporting from there for 79 days, I, I remember you, you and Eamon both and, and others focused a lot on, on the human aspect of it, the people who were suffering, these beautiful people, very young population, vibrant kids, great sense of humor, kids hustling on the streets, you know, real beautiful people. And the tragedies that had befallen all of them, I remember you did a report on the Samuni family that was killed. So you have all these, these personal connections with people that you're trying to tell objective n- news stories about as you're all being bombarded and under siege. Yeah. When you talk me through the emotions of, of telling that story in a state of war while you're on the inside as it's raging. I tried very hard during those days, and, and I describe this in the book, of just focusing on on the people, on the humanity of it, on what this mother um, is trying to do to keep her children safe as possible, to try and distract them from the war, drawing pictures, singing songs. Um, I tried to remove myself a little from the politics and 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 you know the 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 political rhetoric that was going on, so that I can just show people who were watching and there were you know thousands and thousands of people watching us because Eamon and I were the only international correspondents inside of the Gaza Strip in 2008 and so you know I felt this duty to bring that human story so that people can connect so that people can have some empathy because I truly believe that if people had empathy if they could see their own children in the eyes of these Palestinian children they would not allow for this to happen they would not allow for Israel to block off the territory, and then bombard it by air, sea, and land for for two months. This wouldn't be allowed to happen if you could just feel. But the problem was that you know Israel's propaganda was so strong. It had spent so long demonizing Palestinians and really telling everyone um, across the world, and, and, and this was bought even by political leaders and lawmakers, that this is not a territory of people. This is a territory of terrorists that when they were when they blockaded them and bombed them there was no outrage there was no sadness there was no there was no protesting there was nothing um, because there was no empathy for them, um, and this is this is a very strategic way in, was, in which Israel, you know, has gotten away with what it's done in Gaza and what it's how it gets away with what it is doing now. Because collective punishment is a war crime, but when you call it punishment of the collective, and the mm. collective being, you know people who are completely justifiable to be killed because they attack us and they kill us and they take us as hostages, now it becomes not a war crime. Now it becomes justifiable. And that is a very dangerous place to be at, very dangerous rhetoric. Hmm. We're going to circle back to Gaza near the end, but I just want to sort of follow the, the journey that you had. So, and, and I was, in, in some ways, I got, you know, I had a front row seat to your career you know, emerging and, and flourishing and blossoming. Egypt was another big milestone in your, in your career. After Gaza, um, you have the revolution, you have Tahrir. Somebody born and brought up in London of Egyptian, Coptic Egyptian descent. Big moment for you personally and professionally. Talk to, talk to me about Egypt and how you processed Egypt in your writing yeah. as you yeah. sat down to write the book. 
that was one of the hardest bits, you know, because I had to come to terms with my own privilege and my own class structure. Um, I had to come to terms with the fact that I was covering a revolution wanting Hosni Mubarak, the president, to fall. I didn't feel really as much of a journalist as, as an activist during the Egyptian revolution, during the uprising when I was in Tahrir Square. And I had to come to terms with the fact that at the end of the day, I wanted him gone but I didn't want a complete destruction of the class structure, a class structure that my family was part of and um, that I didn't believe was justified in completely demonizing the rich. And, um, you know, and, and, and I didn't feel like that was what the revolution was about. And so in writing, I had to process all of that and my thoughts. Um, and I really write about how that moment when Hosni Mubarak fell, it was such an incredible moment. And I was inside of Tahrir Square and I was interviewing people and the news was spreading. They were saying, you know, the president is gone. The military have just made this big announcement. And there was sort of confusion, but also this this incredible energy. Mm. And I, I know that I think Imran was the moment where I, I realized I wasn't a journalist because in that moment, maybe 15, 20 minutes passed while I was just sitting there absorbing this like euphoric moment. And I looked down and, you know, you, this will be familiar to you, a phone with like 25 missed calls, Doha news desk. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I completely forgot about my actual job because for me, my job was done. Mm. My job was done because I had covered this uprising. I told you that people want him gone. I showed you the corruption in Egypt for many years before that. And now the people had won. And I didn't feel like I needed to continue, right? But at, at mm. the, the truth was, as a journalist, I absolutely needed to continue. As you know, this was the moment when I needed to be on air and talking, but I had no interest. And that's when it, it hit me what I felt my mandate was in life. And later on, when you realized that this was but one major chapter in the ongoing history of the country unfolding, revolution, counter-revolution, push-pull, yeah. Did it depress you? Did it dishearten you? Like everyone else, it was very depressing, and it is very depressing still to see what is happening in Egypt. I mean, I think one could see it as a longer, you know, sort of a small part of a longer story of Egypt and that eventually we will see the people rise again and that the structure will not be able to sustain itself with, with the kind of corruption that we continue to see from the Egyptian. Egyptian military. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, if you were just to isolate this moment, um, the amount of people that were killed and the fact that the counter revolution is in full swing now, and that really, you know, the military has won and continues to win, continues to, um, you know, stifle you know, basic freedoms and certainly freedom of speech and imprison political prisoners and otherwise tens of thousands of them right now in, in Egyptian jails. I think, you know, it, it does feel very defeating, right? Mm -hmm. It does feel like, what, what was that moment? Was it really just the, those few months before we had the elections and before Abdel Fattah al-Sisi took power? Um, or is this part of a larger thing? You said there was a moment at which you realized that you were not really a journalist, I guess more an advocate for human rights, more an ad activist, human rights activist, that moment at Tahrir. Was it more than that, though? Was the work also having an impact on you, on your, on your heart and soul? I mean, I'm sure it was, and I'm sure you write about it at length in the book. Tell me about how much the work began to affect you. And when you realized yeah, you I, needed to do yeah. some work and, and maybe take care of yourself. Yeah, no, thank you for the question, because I feel like I'm not asked that by journalists very often. It's almost like, you know, we don't really want to approach that side of our of our job. And I talk in the book really candidly about the sort of macho culture of war journalism and how I never really fit in and how I cried all the time and how I once cried on air and had all these people write in going, you know, who is this child that you've put on air, Sky News, who's crying through um, her reporting in, in Gaza, I think it was at the time. So, I, you know, I write about this culture. And I also write about post-traumatic stress, about my colleagues' um, reactions and also my own reaction, the, the numbing that I felt after covering a war, coming back, going back to my home in London, sitting with my parents and staring at the wall for days mm. without really understanding or being able to absorb anything more. Um, I write about how my colleagues who took to alcohol or drugs, suddenly they were helped because that was, you know, 
classic PTSD or they, you know, if you were walking down the street and the car backfired, you would scream and run for shelter and then go, okay, well, that's PTSD. But then there's much more subtle things that happen. And like I'm saying that sort of that numbing, that not feeling anything, that that sadness, that crying. And um, I think I think that's a side that we, we don't get help with. Um, and I, although I think we've come a little bit further since I was a journalist and, and there is a little bit more in terms of mental health um, you know, AIDS and, and people sort of seeing that this is a real problem within war journalism. I think it's still very much a, a, a macho culture. Wow. And I think it's very difficult for journalists to speak up and say, I can't go to Iraq right now. I just came back from Yemen and I'm feeling something that I need to process. Mm. That, that's not acceptable. It's not acceptable. Um, and so what happens is it's like, you know, a glass of water that you just keep filling, filling, filling until it overfills. And I certainly had my, had my time when it felt like it was, you know, spilling over. And I describe that, um, you know, without without fear of, you know, judgment and not being seen as macho, I describe it in my book vividly. And your work was still magnificent even as you struggled, as everybody struggles, really. It's just that few are willing to admit it. Um, Shireen, do you remember your first live in Lebanon? I do, and that's also in the book. <laughs> do you know who the anchor was in Doha? I, I, I think I blanked the whole thing out. It was so traumatic. Was it, was it you? <laughs> I don't remember much, and as I say, I haven't read your book, but I remember you hitting the ground. I remember hearing in my earpiece, so I think you were already off air, but I remember something, because you mentioned your parents now. You said, can somebody call my mom and tell her I'm okay? <laughs> I remember those words uh, vividly. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. mean, it's, it, t tell me about that, Shireen, on that day in Lebanon. I think there were some clashes at a university somewhere in Beirut, and things were very unstable at that moment in time. Two little factions clashing, and you went there, and something went wrong. I can't remember exactly. Tell me about that, yeah. Shireen, versus the Shireen that decided actively to step off the train after winning all these awards, covering all these wars, for Al Jazeera, for Sky, that Shireen in her late 30s that decided, mid to late 30s that decided, no, I'm done now. I, I want to take a different path. Tell me the, the difference yeah. between the two. Yeah, I mean, this was sort of Lebanon 2007, the beginning of you know these huge, very complicated clashes between different factions. My first story, I'm there as a producer, but all the correspondents end up super busy and it's a huge story. And so they're like, okay, Shireen, you're up, you're, you're on TV. Um, I described the, my very, very, very first live, which actually was from the studio before I went out into the field. Mm -hmm. um, and I described falling off the chair because oh. it was a swivel chair. And, it, and it's, it's, it's a very funny story. I'm not gonna ruin it for you but so I, I describe the sort of candid moments of television in, in there too but yeah I mean I think what you're describing is sort of the, those those following days where mm. there were you know very intense clashes on the streets of Beirut like like truly all over the place like there was no front line at that point mm. um, and and you know this is a very naive young Shireen who has spent now 25 years living in London in St. John's Wood in a very sort of nice little neighborhood I'd never l left my home and spent a night out my parents were super protective um i never went on holiday by myself i um i'd barely sort of you know i'd barely i'd barely grown up as a human being to be honest at that point and um and there i was in lebanon with the shooting and the and, and, but but i i also sort of describe how i felt this very you know, this sense inside of me that I was meant to be there and that this was something that was helping address, you know, some of the injustice and the inequality that I'd seen growing up and visiting the Middle East. And, you know, it felt not like charity work anymore, which I had done a little bit growing up and done a little bit with my mother. This felt like something I could actually contribute to. I can tell the story of these people fleeing. I can tell the story of, of this conflict. Um, and I felt like this very strong mandate. And then, you know, as you said, fast forward to the Shireen Moore of today, and, I, and I've sort of honed in on what that mandate is. See, I think if you go into journalism wanting to change the world, you're going to be, you know, 
perpetually disappointed and disillusioned because your mandate is not to change policy as a journalist. Your mandate is to tell the story. And, and perhaps many of us hoped that we would change policy, that it would mm. do something, it would move people, it would move them to protest. And then the politicians would see that there's a protest and policy would change. But it's not your job to directly affect policy. And that is the bit that, you know, I've transitioned from because I decided, I think, standing in that in that square in Tahrir, that I wanted to change things. I wanted it to be my job to to make sure that President Mubarak had fallen and for me not to end until like my job not to end until he fell. It wasn't good enough that, you know, you've covered the protest for two weeks. OK, now go to Iraq. Someone else will cover the rest of it. That was very unsatisfying for me. And so now I have a job that, you know, very frustrating as well, because, mm -hmm. you know, we're dealing with such huge um, crises and conflicts and wars, and it is not easy to negotiate and try and insert human rights language into, you know, the, the story of these conflicts. But but at least I feel like it is my job to change policy, to make sure the Syrian president um, one day faces justice, to make sure that there is some accountability for the war crimes that we are seeing. I see the story now until the very end. Mm. I don't. I'm not. I'm not. I don't have to be at the other side of a of a phone call to my editor, say, you know, yanking me off one story and taking me to the next. Downstream of a journalism career, especially a war journalism career, yes, there is going to be that cynicism eventually and that questioning of. What am I really doing? Am I really making an impact? Is this all make-believe? Is this all just, yeah. are we all playing dress up? Downstream of a human rights advocacy career as well, let's kind of take that wet towel and wring it a little bit. Tell me a bit about those frustrations because yeah. you can say these are war crimes and let's, let's maybe specify with, with Gaza. You can say, okay, Hamas, yeah. this in, with the human rights paradigm, these actions are wrong. If you say Israel in a human rights paradigm, these actions are wrong, collective punishment, you know, potential war crimes and, and all of that. And then what? You're still at the mercy of the politicians, right? So you can put yeah. it out there. Tell me what's yeah. the qualitative difference between that and yeah. just telling the truth as a, as a journalist, as, yeah. you know, reporting on a story as yeah. you see it. Yeah, fair enough. Really, really, really good question. Um, one I grapple with. I think I see it as in the process of making change, there are many different roles that need to be played. And I think journalism is one role that needs to be played. I mean, and we rely as human rights advocates on journalists to make a story and make everyone care about it so that we can then get into the room. We could then have some leverage. So journalism is very important in terms of, you know, one of the one of the links in that chain to making change. Advocacy is also another link. I I'm not saying that advocacy is any more important than journalism in the, in the process of making change. What I'm saying is that if you have it in you as a person right now watching, that you, you want to dedicate your life to some sort of change making, be very realistic about what, what part of that chain, what link you would like to do. Because if you go into it wanting more direct policy change, if you go into journalism mm -hmm. wanting direct policy change, it's very disillusioning. If you if you then you know have my journey and you sort of exhaust the journalism aspect of it, and then you you choose the advocacy, you then realize like the the journey, the sort of trajectory of change and policy change, uh, and that makes it a little bit easier to reconcile your your part of it. You, you, I can now say I have been on the side of you know trying to create some sort of empathy for Gaza and document in my way, in the way that I was reporting what was going on. But now I feel like I want to be on the other end of it. I want to take that and put it in front of policymakers and try and change their minds about, you know, what, what they're seeing. And, and I'm not saying that I have any luck when I go in front of the Syrian ambassador and I talk to him about, you know, using chemical weapons. I think mm. I get nowhere in that. But I do get somewhere when I speak to some of the other ambassadors mm. and I show them the, you know, what, what evidence Amnesty International, you know, investigators have gathered and, you know, overwhelming, um, you know, examples of war crimes being committed and so on. I do, I do think that we make a difference. And I think that a lot of the time, the difference that human rights advocates are making is, is so subtle um, and there's really no glory in it because most of the time we're just stopping things from getting any worse. We're not right. making them much better. Yeah. Um, and that, that's a very subtle and a silent and almost invisible uh, impact to make. Mm. Do you find that they quote you and they cite you and they love you when they get to showcase your investigations and your advocacy about the other side and what they've done. 
but then when it comes to themselves, they say, no, this is, this is not credible and oh, I'm so sorry, absolutely. Amnesty is lying, yeah? Everyone does that. And I mean, I think Russia, Ukraine is a great example where, you know, we r r report, you know, as Amnesty International, we put our report out on Ukraine and, 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 and what, what's happening in, in Ukraine and possible war crimes and so on. And then the Russians love us and they say all of this. And then we go to the Russians, we say, well, given that, you know, we're so credible with you, how about the 700 other things that we, we put out on, on your war crimes and so oh. on? And then they're like, no, no, this is really, you know, this is not a credible report. So yeah, I mean, we're absolutely used and abused. But I think we need to look a little bit deeper than that rhetoric and that, you know, that sort of propaganda, if you like, of, mm. of leaders. I mean, our job is a lot more nitty gritty. Our job is a lot more subtle and it takes many, many years. But I, I do believe, you know, when we create a new accountability mechanism to to document war crimes in Syria, for example, as we did a few years ago, that is something that will bear fruit. That is at least, you know, these people who are having their homes bombarded or get their relatives kidnapped they are all of this is being logged and being mm -hmm. you know put into case files um but justice is not you know it's, it's not a short road um and along the way we try and find you know moments of, of, of victories you know someone that we return home to their family someone that we successfully negotiate out of um out of prison or so on but but truly um it is something that you have mm. to as, a, as an advocate, you have to accept the, the, that, vi, you know, that sort of big victory doesn't happen very often. And it is a very frustrating journey. Shireen, it has been wonderful talking to you once again after a long, long time. We're going to put the link to your book, Taking Sides, in the YouTube description. So when the show is uploaded on YouTube, uh, you, can, you can check out Shireen's book, Taking Sides, over there. Really good to see you. I wish you all the best. And, and this has been great. Thanks so much, Shireen. Thanks so much, Imran. Bye-bye.